Yeah. 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 Yeah.
then the cartilage has to absorb more of the concussion. So it's not this normal striation from cartilage down to bone, but the bone gets stiffer. So the cartilage has to absorb more force. And that's again in the knee. So these are all the things that your doctor or your physical therapist might say to you if you sprained your ankle, if you twisted your neck or sprained your knee, you might get some ibuprofen for sure. You're gonna to be told to lose some weight. If it's really bad, uh, you might get a knee brace. The truth is a rice, right? Rest, ice, compression, elevation. The truth is there's no evidence for any of that. There's not even evidence that ice can help with the actual prevention or mitigation of osteoarthritis. Does it help with pain? Yes. Does it help with arthritis? Absolutely unknown. Absolutely no evidence to know if that is true. As we already talked about, when you have this nice articular surface and then you have this exposed bone, now the bone can bleed into the joint. Bone hurts a lot. If anybody in here has broken a bone or twisted an ankle, the, the pain does not come from, again, your cartilage. It comes from your joint capsule, which is really highly innervated. And once you have bone pain, that's when your arthritis really becomes to the stage where you need a joint replacement. And that's when you get this, what we, a joint replacement in uh, surgeon terms is called an arthroplasty. Can do this in dogs, we can't do this in horses. We can do minor parts of joint replacement. In dogs, they can do uh, knees quite well, hips, and to some extent elbows. But in horses, because of laminitis, this isn't really possible. So what do we need to do for these 27 million Americans incidence rate. So that's 27 million each new year that have osteoarthritis. How can we delay or prevent this? And I don't want to make it sound, I don't want to uh, sound like this is cancer, but osteoarthritis costs America more than five times what cancer costs because of the loss in work, the amount of medication and trips to the doctor. So again, it's not cancer, but for cost to the American population and to our healthcare system, osteoarthritis is the number one ranking disease Number two is actually uh, mental health disorders, and then three is cancer. So it's a very, very important disease. As I told you in the knee, uh, so here's a normal knee over here, and then here's an abnormal knee. You can see bone on bone contact, increased bone density on this side. In the knee, your two primary predisposing factors are age is number one and weight is the second one. And that's true for most joints. The hip, uh, fingers would be due to um, mobility issues as well. In the ankle, which is a very unique joint in every species, human, dog, and horse, you do not get arthritis in your ankle unless you've had a traumatic incident. The cartilage in this joint, so here's your ankle. This is the outside. That's your fibula. Uh, this is your talus. Uh, and over on this side, you can see this really severe unrelenting osteoarthritis. And there's really no decent ankle replacement there coming along. But uh, imagine you can kind of get off your knee a little bit. It's harder to get off your ankle, especially if you're a horse, you need to be bearing weight on all four. But you do not get osteoarthritis in an ankle. So that allows us to deconvolve this system in an animal model to say, OK, we can study cartilage damage in, in this ankle model. And then we can say, what things help? Does ice help? Maybe exercise is the best thing. Actually, Scott Rodeo, my colleague at Hospital for Special Surgery, has this mouse model where they injure the cartilage in the mouse and they make them run. And he has, and actually Nelly down campus does the same thing for the patellar tendon. There's actually very good evidence that mild to moderate exercise will help <coughs> mitigate the progression of osteoarthritis or patellar tendinopathy. And you get too far and then it will make the disease worse. But what we don't know is where is that threshold? And at least in this scenario, the idea would be that rest is actually the worst thing. So maybe we're starting to show that rest, ice, compression, elevation, non-steroidals, what is the right thing to slow the progression of this osteoarthritis? So I told you that the ankle is not like the knee. In fact, Kira Novakovsky, who did her PhD in the laboratory and is now a MD uh, family practitioner in Wisconsin, did this really cool study in horses to show that the uh, mechanical response to cartilage in all these joints in the horse, so shoulder, elbow, carpus, fetlock, pastern, hind fetlock, uh, ankle, <coughs> tibia, tailor joint, and the stifle, they all respond differently to mechanical insult with respect to uh, how much cartilage damage is done, how much fissuring there is in the cartilage, and how much chondrocyte, which are the cells that are in cartilage, how many of those cells die. Uh, so we know that all the joints are different. Uh, and because in my laboratory, we want to translate everything that we can learn to help our horses as well as help you as patients and myself, uh, we use the horse as an animal model. So in this case, again, we're using the ankle joint instead of the knee. So as you know, in horses and dogs, this is called the hawk. 
uh, and this is where it is uh, very uh, anatomically analogous to the human. That's to say the same thing in the ankle, whether it's your knee, we have no idea. Steroid injection, platelet-rich plasma, you name it, we have no idea what is the right thing to slow this down. We know when uh, people have moderate ankle sprains, and actually the military is the biggest population for ankle sprains, and you think about twisting your ankle. Not, I'm not talking a car wreck or a broken ankle. I'm talking a mild to moderate ankle sprain, something you would do stepping off the curb. 10 years later, you get arthritis in your ankle. But in the military, think of the paratroopers all the times that they're in these heavy combat boots and they trip on something. They're also carrying much more weight. Remember we talked about three to five times your body weight going through your, and then add what a 60 or 70, or I don't know how heavy their backpacks are, but pretty heavy, I would guess, and, and translate th that to their ankle as well. And this is how an ankle gets sprained. This is from a paper that Michelle Delco uh, did this nice schematic. She's an um, assistant professor at the university here. This is the outside of your joint. This is your fibula. This is your shin or your tibia, and this is the main joint in your ankle. So when you do this sort of ankle sprain, this is the way most of us sprain our ankle, whether it's an athlete or just stepping off the curb. This bone called the talus hits your inside of your uh, bone here called the tibia. And then what happens is the cartilage gets impacted and those cells can die and it can lead to cartilage death and to bone death. And then pretty soon you get whole joint arthritis. How can we stop it at this point to stop the progression down to that area? That's the focus of this work. So there's other animal models than just the horse. So here's the horse. This is that talus again, the, uh, the main joint in your ankle, the main bone in your ankle. Uh, this is another uh, from that Delco paper that I showed earlier. And we, uh, we just went to the butcher shop and got all these different animals. Uh, these are all left talus. And you can see that the pig is the closest. We didn't get the human from the butcher shop. Uh, <laughs> but, the, but the pig is the closest to the human bone. But for any of you that have worked with pigs there, it's a real pain. And if you want to practice and answer those questions that we asked about earlier, if you want to exercise them, or we want to do MRI, their little legs are so short, we can't really get them into the MRI. Um, we, in this study that I'll show you, we want to do repeat synovial fluid analysis because we want biomarkers for joint destruction. Uh, so pigs are just a real pain to work with. Sheep, in my opinion, aren't the best for arthritis. Uh, for those of you that uh, work on sheep, we know that they mount a much more fibrous response. When, you, when they have an incision or an infection, they're just different than humans in the respect to how they respond to injury. Uh, dogs aren't the best model for emotive, emotive reasons, although you could argue that for any of the animal models. And then you can see down here the rat and the mouse you can't even see on here. Uh, Farsh Gilak at Duke does some very elegant work in mouse and rat uh, fracture models into the ankle joint. Uh, pretty difficult to translate that into a human. When you, can, you can do MRI and some other things, but very difficult to get many tissues. So the other thing that we love to say is the horse is much more analogous to the human in forms of an athlete. So this is the first horse that really won the, the Grand Slam, the Triple Crown, and the Breeders' Cup. Scott and I were both there to witness this bit of history. Horses, for some of you that know, when they gallop, they either have one or no leg on the ground, and they can go really fast. Um, these are some averages. This would be a really fast horse. But they can and do sustain injuries very similar to human athletes. Uh, so lots of lots of different ways that they and their riders can get injured. So again, everything we're trying to do is to translate it into the human patient so we can benefit both species at one time. How we do this is uh, when I say we, we have this really fantastic collaborative group. So I'd like to say it's a one uh, medicine approach, but it's cross species, cross campus and cross discipline. So every Thursday morning we have this uh, very geeky group that meet we call cartilage group and there's biophysicists a, a person who just joined who's studying crack propagation so we can learn how if we crack cartilage how how and why it propagates and what does that mean for osteoarthritis scott is also a surgeon and we know when you look into a joint whether it's a human joint or a horse joint you see a crack you don't really know what that means for the prognosis for the horse does that mean oh you're gonna have arthritis in three years or is it like that it's fine we know that the cells along there are dead, but we don't know what that means for prognostication. So this Nicholas Bakulis in the lab uh, in the cartilage group is really, he studied fracture propagation in space. So he's going to help us study fracture propagation in cartilage. Uh, we have a biophysicist, an engineer, a peer physicist, and then three of us from the veterinary college. And what we did was we wanted to say, how can we 
model mild to moderate ankle injury. So we had this uh, spring-loaded impactor. So we want to know exactly how much force we give to the cartilage. This impactor was originally uh, designed by Rocky Tuan, who uh, was at Pittsburgh and now is unfortunately the chancellor at Hong Kong, which isn't looking like the most peaceful place. If you look him up, you'll see all the stuff on his car. Uh, but his group originally invented this impactor and it's just spring loaded. So if you want to hit it harder, you just dial back the spring. Then Larry Benassar and, and our cartilage group outfitted, outfitted it with this LVDT, which is a super high speed camera. So now we can measure rate. We can measure how fast that impact is delivered. So as you can imagine, if you got into a car accident, it doesn't just matter how hard you hit something, but it matters how fast you hit it as well. So this has never been able to be done before that we can actually say, this is actually what the cartilage received and we can measure it. Most other people either hit the cartilage or dropped a, uh, what a what's called a drop tower experiment. So you use gravity as your measurement of speed. Uh, but this is actually something we can do all through a small incision called an arthroscopic incision. And again, we can we can exactly deliver what we want to model, in our case, mild to moderate ankle sprain. So again, we can say we can tell you exactly how many how we can model these small cracks, which you can't even see on a seven Tesla MRI. So this is really mild cartilage injury. The highest magnet injury uh, magnet MRI that you could get would be a three Tesla. We can get mice and rats into probably about a 12 Tesla and you still can't see these cracks. So this is mild cartilage injury. And again, the importance here is that we can measure not just how much force, but how fast we deliver it. Must be the video coming up because it's slow. There we go. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. Let's see, how do I go back one? Slow because the video is loading. <coughs> All right. So this is how we operate them. This is a horse on its back, and this would be the ankle joint that we're going to operate. This is a cadaver horse, and you can see this spring-loaded impactor that's going into the joint here. And we're going to impact three times here on the medial talus. Remember, I told you when you sprain your ankle, that's where you impact your cartilage. That's also important because in the human, uh, Professor Rankin is the one who showed that that is where humans get uh, this impact in arthritis. And here we are operating one of these horses. So you can see this impactor coming in through the joint and you can watch it go bang. That's all you see. Very, very mild cartilage injury. Because of that outfitted, that camera, we can say exactly how many megapascals per second that we delivered to the joint. We can observe this normal synovial membrane. This is that joint capsule I was telling you about that delivers the joint fluid as well as inflammatory cells and takes away waste products. And then here, after we've impacted it, you'll see one, two, three, and this is immediately after impact. So the cartilage is uh, still trying to relax or come back to its normal impact. So uh, that's what it looks like. These horses have maybe a centimeter incision, and then they can go back to their stall and immediate weight bearing. So normal articular cartilage up here, grade zero. This is a well-defined cartilage scoring system. This is articular cartilage on a saffron and nose stain histology. This is the surface up here that's normal. The red indicates proteoglycan, which is really important for your joint for compressive stiffness. Proteoglycans are highly negatively charged, so they bring in a lot of water. So it makes your cartilage absorb a whole a bunch of compression as you walk. So you need uh, proteoglycans. This is called the non-mineralized cartilage. You want it to be dark red in this specific stain. This is mineralized cartilage in this region. So the transition is from softest to a little less soft, and then it comes down into bone is the green part. So that's the normal transition that you want. When you look at uh, different grades of osteoarthritis defined by the ORSI Osteoarthritis Research Society International, you get everywhere up to a grade five. And what we want again is a mild to moderate damage. So here's a mild to moderate damage and you can see some cartilage fraying or fibrillation on the surface. So some minor cracks, some loss in that proteoglycan staining. And then down here, grade four, we're getting much more damage. So we've gotten lost our proteoglycan down to that zone where I told you is a junction between the mineralized and non-mineralized. And then this is a car wreck. That's not what we're aiming for, but if that's what you wanted to study, uh, you could certainly do that with this impactor as well. So at six weeks to validate our model, uh, we want to know again that we're creating osteoarthritis. 
and here's normal over here. This is a little bit older horse, so the red staining isn't as, isn't, isn't as profound, but this is normal over here, so blue and then red, and this transition again. And you can come over here and you can see our very mild impact. So we didn't even really break the surface on this horse. You can, uh, in this region, the cells are proliferating or dividing, so they're trying to repair. Um, and then maybe if you defocus your eye, you can see this bit of bone advancing forward. In normal histology, you should not, this uh, non-mineralized region should stay pretty consistent. And this is called advancement of the tide mark. And that's a very clear sign that the bone is becoming more dense uh, it's a, and that's an indication of osteoarthritis. So arthritis, by our standards as a patient, it's pain and dysfunction. But histologically, these are all the characteristics of arthritis. So again, uh, when you see this starburst effect, that's where the impactor has been. That's immediately after impact. And you can see these starbursts. Nicholas, again, is we're going to quantify these cracks. How long are the cracks? How deep are the cracks? How many dead cells are around the cracks? And how does that relate to what the horse ends up with end stage arthritis? Uh, this one we cracked a little bit more, and then again, we want full thickness. So this is what we're going for in our model, very mild cartilage injury. So to test this model, a company from Loon Sweden came along and had this specific form of stem cells. Uh, these are alpha 10, beta 1, and they chose these stem cells, and they did the basic science behind these cells to say, we think these are going to be the best stem cells because if they are high expressing this cell surface marker, this alpha 10, beta 1, they should stick to cartilage and therefore they should be more reparative. That was their uh, philosophy. And this was a preclinical study for use in humans. So uh, Bob Weiss and the other associate deans at Cornell have always been generous at Cornell that when we do preclinical studies, so we do studies in horses or in dogs or in rabbits that are meant for human use, we get a reduced rate compared to other research programs. But this also means that you have to do it in compliance with FDA and other government associations. So there's a tremendous amount of paperwork associated with this, which makes your science better. But actually that says in revision, that's actually been accepted to American Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, so I said at the very beginning that the, the stem cell field is the wild west still, and people advertise ridiculous things for stem cells. Uh, everything from these amniotic stem cells to uh, the dental stem cells are the hot thing in veterinary medicine right now. And it's literally chopped up dental pulp. So underneath your tooth, you have pulp. And if you actually read what's in that literature, it's chopped up dental pulp. And they're saying, well, they're stem cells because they prey on the literature that somebody once upon a time proved that there were stem cells in dental pulp. And then these companies come along and say, yeah, so we have dental pulp, which has stem cells in it, but they're not exactly saying that their product has stem cells. So the consumer can be very uh, misled. And that's a lot of what that podcast is about as well. But we're talking about cultured stem cells, verified and validated as true stem cells. Stem cells you can get from anywhere in your body. There are embryonal stem cells, which you get from the inner cell mass of a day eight blastocyst. So this is eight days after, this is a horse blastocyst eight days after uh, conception. All of this out here are called the trophoblasts, and that's what's gonna become the placenta in the horse or in the human. And inside here is called the inner cell mass. And that's about 16 cells. And that's where you get embryonal stem cells from. You can also make embryonal stem cells as we did here from skin cells by introducing a lot of different genes. Uh, we gave up on embryonal stem cells in my lab probably in around 2010 or something like that. It, they're just so much work, way more work than uh, I was willing to put into them. So we focus on adult derived bone marrow derived stem cells. Uh, and you can get them from a lot of different places in the body, but adult drive can primarily are come from bone marrow adipose uh, that come from anywhere. People disagree in what you need to do to be qualified to be a stem cell. In 2016, there was a landmark manuscript by Dominici who said you need to qualify by these three things to say you're a stem cell. And that really still kind of holds true for the most part. People can disagree with bits and pieces of it, but uh, for scientific reasons, that's still the qualification. So what people used to think, and what you'll still hear all kinds of doctors say, how stem cells work is, I'm going to give you stem cells, and it's going to regrow the cartilage in your joint. 
or I'm going to give you stem cells and you're going to regrow nerves or something like that. And that is completely not true. Even in 2011, that Rocky Twan, who I told you, helped make that impactor. He and I published in Small Animal Surgery. If you took a stem cell, it should go down some tissue line. Maybe you can reverse it. But the idea was if you put a bone marrow drive stem cell into the joint, at the time, we all thought somehow magically the environment, the joint environment turned that cell into a chondrocyte that turned into cartilage and that regrew your joint. Not true. I know that sounds like science fiction and it wasn't true, but, but we were seeing results. At all these stem cell studies, people were seeing results. So then uh, Bruce Bunnell in this manuscript came out with this idea that if you have a stem cell, it's kind of inactivated and it needs to be kicked down one pathway or the other. So, so you couldn't just take this stem cell and put it into a joint uh, because it wouldn't do anything. But if you had the stem cell and you put it into a, a very inflammatory environment like an inflamed joint, then it could go on to early tissue response. In contrast, if you're looking for stem cells, and probably the biggest area that stem cells have promise are in immunosuppression for things like multiple sclerosis, uveitis, other graft versus host diseases. Uh, so he had this idea that it did these two different things. Stem cells could go to a good side or to a bad side, and that's not true either. So how do stem cells work? Hmm. That's interesting, brought up the manuscript. All right, twice it's doing that. I didn't even know the link was live in there. That one, there we go. Okay, uh, so now how we're pretty sure that stem cells work, although we thought we were pretty sure in 2011, um, is this idea of paracrine or trophic effects. So you have a stem cell and they're again, quiescent as most people thought they were. Something activates them. It can be something as simple as if you get a bad bruise in your muscle, right? You run into the corner of a table. Some of those cells are going to die and those dead cells are going to release their DNA. That can activate stem cells. Or inflammation, bacteria, infection can activate these stem cells. And that's not the stem cell that does the work. It's what the cells secrete. So these are called paracrine fractors. Some people call it the trophic effect. This is called the secretome. And depending on the size of these vesicles that these cells secrete, they can be called exosomes, microvesicles. So you're going to see a lot of this coming along, that companies already are saying, we're selling secretome, we're selling exosomes. Uh, it's going to be shady for a while until the FDA really comes along and says, you have to prove these three things to say that's what's in there. It sounds really fancy, but really what it is, is if you just grow stem cells, it's whatever they let off. So just collect the media that you're growing them in, the nutrient media, and that should contain your secretome. So you can take this media, these secretome, and you can, you can purify them if you want to. You can filter them. Uh, you can do lots of different things to purify them, either by sizes, and then you can test their different effects. So we know that they can recruit cells to that local environment. They can recruit natural stem cells. So your muscle, your skin, your hair, everything has stem cells. They're just quiescent and they can't get to where they need to go. So the, you put a stem cell in, it's activated, it secretes these paracrine factors, and that's what kickstarts the functional tissue healing. New blood vessels and this immunomodulatory effect, so decreasing inflammation. Inflammation is good to some extent in the beginning, but you really need to flip that inflammation off and turn it into a reparative effect pretty quickly. And that's what this uh, secretome is really good at doing. So this company, again, took these alpha-10, beta-1 uh, because their idea was that here's a, the alpha-10, beta-1 subunit on a cell. So this is meant to be a cell surface membrane and you have all kinds of receptors on your cell surface. So their idea was if we can make cells that are selected for this, what's called an integrin or a cell surface receptor, then they'll stick to cartilage. So they took, if you took bone marrow and it looks like this is what stem cells look like. It doesn't matter where you get them from. If you get them from adipose or placenta or skin, they all look like this growing in tissue culture. And you can't tell which one is more stem like or which one's more like a skin cell. So that's what this is meant to depict where you have a, a heter very heterogeneous population of cells. 
And now when you select them for this alpha 10 beta one, they become more homogeneous, more like themselves and more STEM like according to this company's data. And they have pretty decent data that they've published very recently. Um, oh, so they also show that these are MHC class two negative, which is really important because the idea for this company is to sell them off the shelf allogeneic. So I can give my stem cells to Steve. Steve can give me his stem cells and I don't mount an immune rejection. Even 10 years ago, people would say, oh, stem cells are immunoprivileged. You can, you can cross them back and forth. And that's not true. But this MHC class two is a cell surface receptor that is very well recognized for immune rejection. And stem cells are usually, uh, should be MHC class two negative, but they can become positive in certain environments. So it's important that cells that you want to use in an allogeneic non-self way are MHC class two negative and these cells are. So we take these cells, we impact the horses I showed you in our validated model, we wake them up, and then four days later, we put these cells into the horse's joint. Six months later, so then we exercise them and we take synovial fluid or joint fluid off of their joints at least a dozen times, which you can't do it any other species. They're allowed to, as soon as their stitches came out at day 10, they're allowed free range exercise. And then we put them down at six months. And the first thing we did, of course, was to open up the joints and have a look. And then you can, uh, this is just uh, one horse. So in the horse, uh, one of the advantages to decrease the number of horses that we use is to use the own horse as its control. So in these animals randomized, either the left or the right hawk, they both got impacted. And then one got treated with stem cells and the other one got a vehicle control, which is saline. So they both got injected, but only one got injected with stem cells. So here's the left limb or the control limb of a horse, this horse Fred. And on the right limb, these are the three joints. So this is that talus, that trochlear ridge of the talus I was telling you about. And here's medial or the inside. So here's where we impacted that horse. And then we do a very simple thing and paint on India ink, which is just particulated carbon. And India ink sticks to collagen, which shouldn't be on the surface of cartilage. And it just sticks to what, remember that area where I showed you that's like fibrillated or broken cartilage. It looks a little bit like shag carpet. So now when we paint it with India ink, you can see all the cartilage damage. Remember we only impacted this horse three times. So this horse is starting to get widespread arthritis throughout at least the talus. And then we wanna look at the opposing joint surface, which is the tibia and make sure that we are not have, if we are, that we can quantify the uh, arthritis throughout the whole joint. And then in the horse's right leg, the opposite, again, here's the medial side, but now we paint it with India ink and we don't see anything. And we look at the tibia and we don't see anything either. And if you defocus your eyes, perhaps you can see that these three are dull and these three are shiny. Can you see that? So what causes joints to be shiny, in my era when I was taught in veterinary school would be HA, acid, hyaluronic acid. Uh, we now know, and actually one of the world's foremost lubricant experts in the world is Heidi Riesink, who's an assistant professor here. Uh, so lubricant is actually C-I-N, not S-Y-N. Lubricant S-Y-N is an oral medication that has no evidence behind it that's given to horses as well. Um, <laughs> but lubricant, uh, C-I-N, is this molecule that causes joints to lubricate, as you might imagine. So we didn't a priori, we didn't set out to look at this, again, because this is FDA guidelines, we had to use validated scoring systems. And we never thought we would see this. Like who would think to look for shininess of a joint? Good luck reporting that. Um, but we noticed this immediately. And within, by the second horse, I think we had eight horses in the study. Uh, we were easily like, that must be the stem cell treated side. And, and remember, I told you, we can measure how much impact they all got. So we know that these, each of these impacts, all three of them, we measured how many megapascals per second, how, many, uh, how much impact they got. So we know there's no difference between these horses left and right side or between impacts uh, one, two, and three. So what's causing this, we don't know, but that's the first observation that we made, which held true for all the horses. Uh, now, if we just go down here, because I've already explained the saffron and no, this is just a little bit different stain. This is called H&E, but it, it tells the same story. So this is saffron and no on the control side. So within that same joint, normal. So remember we have the red all the way down this is the non-mineralized articular cartilage, mineralized, and then bone down here. 
So this is a non-impacted side. This is as normal as this horse is going to get. Uh, and then the uh, mesenchymal stem cell treated side and the non-impact. So now you impact this horse and this is the non-MSC treated side. This is that impacted region, but now stem cell treated. So yeah, we have a little bit of fibrillation on the surface up here is, or loss, but for the most part, the cartilage is intact. We've lost some proteoglycan, the cells are missing from in here, but it looks nothing, this is a complete obliteration of articular cartilage in the control treated side, same horse, so impacted saline, impacted MSC. Another horse over here, impacted, saline treated. You can see there's no proteoglycan from here to there. You can see that the bone is resorbing, the cartilage completely lost. And in the impact plus MSC treated side, we have some cartilage cracks going down, but by far much better uh, uh, cartilage preservation. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for mitigation or preservation of the articular cartilage surface. And I told you what we thought when we saw the shininess is related to lubricin. So Heidi Resink again has developed this lubricin antibody so we can look and see where is the lubricin in these joints. In these cases, lubricin, it will stain brown. And on the control treated side, this would be normal for a horse. You can see the it, within each cell. It's very important when you do these immunohistochemistry studies to look at things in, in really high powered fields so you know it's distributed in the right way. Are you looking at something that's in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm or in the matrix? And in this case, it's within the cell. In the impacted side, we see no difference in lubricin between control and impact. However, when we impact and treat with stem cells, we see an increase in intensity. So we're seeing more lubricin throughout the joint as well as in the depth. So we're seeing more lubricin being expressed in the deeper zones than we are in the impact non-treated. So somehow the stem cells are either increasing lubricin or at least preserving it compared to impact and control. Remember earlier on I told you arthritis, at least in the knees, starts with increased bone density. So the bone gets too dense and the cartilage can't absorb the force. And in normal cartilage, again, from if this is the surface of your joint, this is the softest portion down to here, so absorbs all the concussion. And then it becomes a little bit stiffer where you get mineral, and then it becomes stiffer where your bone. So we're looking for normal bone to regular pattern in here. Increased bone density is called sclerosis. And again, that leads to stiff bone. If this bone becomes more stiff, then your cartilage takes more force. So they all go together in arthritis. Stiffer bone, cartilage starts to wear, the cartilage wears, it can't absorb force, the cartilage, the bone gets stiffer. Uh, so when we graded these x-rays in these horses, we took them every month and we took four views of each hawk and we could see increased sclerosis in the x-ray, but, and we were blinded to which horse is which, but you never want to really, you don't really want to trust your eyes. You want something that's automated that can be computer, uh, computer generated. So we took our histology uh, slides and Michelle Delco did this in the laboratory where we wrote a code and you can put the slides through there and say, okay, measure how much open space there is. Tell me how much open space there is in this bone compared to how much dense bone there is. And in the control area, so again, we're looking under here in this uh, sub underneath chondral. So underneath the cartilage, we're looking immediately in this subchondral space, not way down here, because this is, when this is what gets dense, that's what makes the cartilage absorb more uh, concussion. So in the control side, uh, you can see these nice open trabecular spaces. And then the impact, you can see how dense this bone is up on top. There's very few open spaces, unlike here, measured from the exact same distance from, uh, whoopsie, go back. Uh, measure the same distance from underneath here to here. And then in the impact from uh, when you treat with mesenchymal stem cells, there's preservation of much of this trabecular space, uh, statistically different uh, based on, on uh, code analysis, so quantify, quantifiable. This has never been shown before. Nobody's ever looked for this in stem cells. Nobody's looked for lubricin. Nobody's looked for bone. Everybody looks for increased cartilage as opposed to preservation of articular cartilage. So this study is the first one that says, you know, people think about bone and cartilage together all the time, but this is the first day that says, wow, we're protecting that bone. By protecting the cartilage, 
we're protecting the bone from our, uh, arthritis as well. So of course, the natural questions are, what happens if you go out a year? What happens if you exercise these horses? What happens if they start jumping? Um, so those would be the natural progression of the future studies. Stem cells work in a lot of different ways. And I told you about the trophic factors or immunomodulation. And one of them is through this substance called PGE2 or prostaglandin E2, uh, shown for the first time actually in stem cells by another equine surgeon at Colorado State, Wayne McElwraith, that put stem cells, uh, not selected like this, but bone marrow derived stem cells into the knees of horses and showed that they had an increase in PGE2. So, I mean, across the whole literature, so it's, Veterinary medicine is just such a cool thing, as you can probably hear from my enthusiasm for our career, that another veterinarian was the first one to show that PGE2 was increased after stem cell administration in the horse. Um, but in the treated side, you can see that in general, the PGE2 is higher in the, in the treated. And you can see, these are all the different times that we took synovial fluid from these horses. So these are different joint taps, all these different times. Again, not possible in any other species to show that this is how the stem cells are working. And remember when that video was showing, I was like, it's important to look at that joint capsule, that synovial membrane. The first thing I teach when I pop a scope, an arthroscope into the joint is look at the, at the joint capsule. That will tell you everything about the homeostasis of that joint. If it looks like an anemone and you can see a, a you can literally see blood pulsing through it, it's pretty normal. If it looks like your pudgy fingers, it's not so good. It's got some, uh, some long-term inflammation in it. Uh, so these are histologic samples that we scored uh, in conjunction with Andrew Miller, who's a, a board side certified pathologist here. And when we score these things, we don't know which horse is which. We have our little scoring systems uh, and we consensus score them. So we discuss the slides and then we, we arrive at a score. So at time zero, here's what Snowville membrane looks like. Very, uh, this is called the intimal layer. So that's really, you see right there, it's only one cell thick. They have some, a few red blood cells going through here. Uh, here's again at time zero, so one cell thick, and then there's some other fatty tissue underneath it. We rescoped these horses at six weeks, did another arthroscopic examination, scored the joints, and took a synovial membrane biopsy. And now you can see that there's many more cells, so some inflammation still present. And then at six months in the treated side, when we, um, so there's no difference when they, when they, um, when they share a letter like this, there's no statistical difference. So control and treated at day zero are not different. At six weeks, they still share A and B. At six months post-op, however, the treated side, the treated side had more cells than the control or treated at time zero. So the natural gut reaction to this would be there's more inflammation in the treated side, but these cells and the treated side over here turn out to be what we call M2 macrophages. So they're macrophages that are into functional tissue regeneration. So remember I said earlier, we want some inflammation, but pretty soon you have to turn the clock to go from inflammation to functional tissue regeneration. So again, if you just looked at, this is the first time this has been shown in animal model as well. If you just looked at nucleated cells, you would say, ha ha, you have allogeneic stem cells, you inside it in it, in it, in it, an inflammatory response, but we don't see what are called neutrophils. So there's not really inflammation here. Uh, and then we did some special stains to show that these are indeed these M2 macrophages. So the take home message in the whole thing is really, it is this secretome. It's these cells that secrete this trophic factor. And for the first time we can show that stem cells not just affect and, and protect the articular cartilage, but they protect the bone and can really use the joint capsule or that synovial membrane as its machinery to effectuate its repair. And these are some of the wonderful people in the lab who helped do this work. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Do you have any questions online, Sarah? Not yet. Dr. Palmer? So when you have an acute inflammatory response and you put stem cells in it, I'm presuming that it has an effect, anti-inflammatory effect to some degree, and hopefully you're going to grow some healthy tissue if you're doing that. But if you have a more degenerative chronic situation, you put stem cells in it, it doesn't seem to work quite as well. Is that a function of too much, too late, or too little too late, rather? Or, or, or does it turn a joint around and make it a great joint again? 
So the question for online people is, uh, it looks like from this study when we or others, when you put things into an acute response, whether it's a joint or a tendon, that they do pretty well. And then you put stem cells in a little bit later and they don't seem to do so well. Is it too little too late? I would say yes, because now you're talking about bone disease as well. So when we do this initially, we're just, we're probably impacting the bone a little bit, but this is primarily a cartilage and infl inflammation from the surgery. Uh, but once you have bone degeneration, I'm much more skeptical. You know, from looking at x-rays, once you see increased bone density, there's nothing we're gonna do to turn that around. In contrast, in a tendon, I think what we can do for a tendon, if you have a, a chronic tendinopathy, and chronic is really defined as more than six weeks, you already have scar tissue. And if the horse or the human keep re-injuring their Achilles tendon, or for the horse, their superficial flexor tendon, there's a procedure called 10X, that you can actually take that scar tissue out just like they take out a lens, so phycoemulsification. And I've only done it in one horse so far, but uh, it's common in humans for plantar fasciitis and for Achilles tendinopathy. So if you have a chronic, chronic Achilles, it's no bigger than a 16 gauge needle. And again, it's the same. You just put it into the, you can put it ultrasound guided and you can put it right into the lesion. And it, now you've turned it into an acute lesion. And now you can put your stem cells in there and do functional regeneration. I think one of the key things for all of this is rehab. And especially in the acute scenario, it's been common. It's common for us as human patients, as well as our equine patients or the dog, right? People stuff the horses in a box stall. You let your dog lie around because you're afraid it hurts a little bit or we hurt. So your doctor tells you to go on crutches, but maybe that's the worst thing. Maybe you really need to get back moving. And that's my biggest hope that what this model can help teach us. Yes. This might be getting like a little ahead of everything, but um, how long do you think it would be until we start implementing this? I mean, for humans, I know this will be a little while, but for animals specifically, dogs and horses and things like that, how long do you think it'll be before we're like applying this to surgery and, and things like that? We've been doing it for a couple of decades. Oh. <laughs> uh, we actually have the exact same FDA regulations as people. It's a very common misconception that, uh, oh, you can do anything you want to in the horse or the dog because the FDA doesn't care about you. And that's not true. Uh, they, they have more FDA officers for people uh, and the false advertising for the stem cell world in people is really where the FDA officers will get them. We have a exemption from the FDA here because we're doing clinical trials. So we don't actually, you can't make any, and we don't make any money on doing them. It kind of pays for the culture is about it. Uh, but we've been doing horses for joints and tendons for a very long time. And uh, probably in the last year or so, we've hired Chris Fry in sports medicine here. And he's on board with, uh, we're going to start culturing stem cells for, in him for his uh, canine patients as well. So it hasn't been like implemented necessarily in regular um, practice. Yeah, in regular practice, but we're looking like within the next couple of years. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty common in practice. Uh, and UC Davis is actually the ones who are leading it, I would say, in small animal. And in large animal, it would be us, Colorado, uh, Virginia, Blacksburg have a stem cell. They have a, they, the, both of those have actual stem cell companies. We don't have a company. We do it in the laboratory and to treat our patients here. Um, but it, so if, for example, this horse that I operated last week has pretty bad malacia or softening of its cartilage and the owner was in such shell shock because it's only a four-year-old horse. And I was like, okay, go home. And maybe we can consider these couple things and maybe we can consider stem cells. So in that instance, that referring veterinarian could get bone marrow from that horse, send it here. We can culture the cells and we can send them back. And Davis actually, ha UC Davis has some fascinating work on this gum disease in cats called stomatitis, which they can't really control in the cats and they lose all their teeth. And apparently they don't eat well and you're naughty and let you know more about this than I do. But they're, they've saved 50% of these cats when apparently it was like a hundred percent death rate before. I don't know, but, but they're making Davis is especially in small animal uh, things. And then there's other things that we don't think about for stem cells. You know, we all think about them as growing cartilage, growing tendons uh, in plastic surgery. One of the biggest ways to use stem cells is after irradiation. 
So to use adipose derived stem cells in an irradiated area stops a lot of the scarring. So there's some really much cooler ways to use stem cells as well. Um, from time zero, how long does it take for the sclerosis to be evident on a radiograph? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think with a good radiograph, four to six weeks. And, and I think it has to be a lot of times, you know, you just have to like stand back a little bit and be like, oh yeah, there it is. Uh, and it depends on the joint. And, you know, for the hawk, it would be harder to see because you have to get the, especially in the medial trochlea, it's hard to pick that off. But what do you think, Scott, in a horse ankle, four weeks after training, you can start to see the bone density? Sure. I think it's very important. One of the things we're looking at is trying to be able to diagnose normal versus abnormal bone volume fraction in young horses and mitigate the progression by modifying the training programs. The bone volume fraction is another is a nicer way of saying what, how much open space there is compared to how much bone. And that's that's all that matters is if you have more bone than normal or if it's progressing and you're getting more and more bone and less of those open spaces. Again, that bone is getting more dense. It's getting more brittle. It can outstrip its blood supply. Uh, and this is this is buck shins and people as well. Shin splints. It's the exact same thing that uh, all those cadets did. And for any of you that have long legs, you probably got it when you ran track too. <laughs> I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> Perkins might have, but. <laughs> so do you see it moving to the secretome and not needing this, like having the cells and cell culture and just harvesting the secretome? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jillian asked, uh, it, do I see it moving towards the secretome? I can, I, I, I at least know of five companies that are already working towards secretome, at least two in veterinary medicine and three in humans. So I'm sure there's orders of magnitude more than that. In our lab and Laura's in the back, um, but we're, so there's this really, really cool study. As I told you, so one of the other weird things about stem cells when we would put them into joints and we thought, well, or in a tendon and we're like, well, this really works. And then people wanted to know where the stem cells go so they can track them. You can use different things. Like you can put male stem cells into a female and track chromosomes. You can label them with different things and find out where they go. Well, they die within a couple of days. So people that didn't believe in stem cell therapy were like, how can they be working? They're dead. And then this uh, secretome idea came along. But there's this really cool mouse study. Uh, remember, I, I keep talking about these M2, these functional tissue regenerative macrophages. And there's this really cool my, mouse study that they label the mouse's macrophages uh, and they label the mouse's stem cells. They put that mouse's stem cell back into the mouse and they show that like a lot of people that most of them get eaten up by the lung, they get sequestered in the lung, but the stem cells that have the effect get eaten by M2 macrophages. So the question is, what is the best secretome? Is it, there's a really elegant study that says bone marrow derived is better than adipose, that filtered is better than spinning them really fast, ultracentrifugation, that's the best secretome. We think, and we've filed intellectual property in the lab that um, the best secretome will be an M2 macrophage eats the MSC and the secretome comes from the M2 macrophage, not the MSC. That's what we think, All but right. we don't know yet. We're still working on watching one cell eat the other so we know that that's what happened. We have an online question. Someone's asking about polyacrylamide gel. <laughs> uh, there's two different companies that sell polyacrylamide gel. Uh, Noltrex is one of them. And uh, I have no, I've not done any work with them. I've signed a non-disclosure agreement with Noltrex because they want to know how it's working as well. So the, what they say to you, uh, has anybody ever poured a, poly, a page of polyacrylamide gel in the laboratory? Anybody ever run a, a gel? Says Laura. So polyacrylamide is a known neurotoxin. Even once you've, so it's a liquid and then you add this other really smelly reagent and it forms a gel and you use it to run proteins so you can look at your proteins or your DNA. And even once you've made this gel, you have to dispose of it in a very, very clear way because it's again, a known neurotoxin. You don't wanna dump it down the drain and be killing off all the fish. 
So those of us that know about polyacrylamide gel, when the company came out with us, we're like, they're putting that into a horse joint. It seems to work. Uh, the companies don't know why. What they say to you is it's a cushion. They say it cushions the ends of the joint. I don't buy that for a second. Like, don't tell me you're going to put a liquid into a horse's joint. Even the joint fluid in a horse's joint doesn't cushion the joint. It's uh, the people that know more about lubrication than I do liken it to you hydroplaning, right? So you're, there's your tire and that's one form of the cartilage. And then there's the road and you want that slippery surface in between, but that doesn't mean that you're cushioned. You know what I mean? Like, so, so I don't buy that it's cushiony. Is it burning the joint capsule and being a neurotoxin? Maybe. Uh, we do know that the Noltrex and the other polyacrylamides get taken up into that joint capsule and they stay there forever in these little micelles in these uh, secret secretomes, but not in secretome, in these secreted vesicles. Uh, so the company does want to know how is it working? Uh, so I didn't want to do the study. So uh, Heidi Resink, again, who studies lubrication, is going to do a study with them to say, does it help with joint lubrication? So we don't know how it works, but they they will say it's a cushion in the joint. Do you have any comments, Scott? No. <laughs> <laughs> it says, I understand that water is the substance that affords the cushion, but are there hydrophilic and therefore adhere to the water within the cartilage? the proteoglycans in the cartilage are what bring in the water. So even if the acrylamide people say that it brings in water, that might be true, but I still don't believe that it is a cushion between joint ends. And we, there's no evidence that that actually gets incorporated into the cartilage itself. Uh, does it lubricate the joint? Maybe, we don't know. Uh, and again, is it a neurotoxin for the joint? Uh, some companies have done a little bit of work and said, we don't think so, but uh, I think the jury's still out. So the trick is to know when your horse has the trauma to its joint. Like it everything. something minor. It could be, some, could be the falling over picture she show, or it could be something while it's running in the field and no one can see. Agree. The trick to all of this stuff, it doesn't matter what disease it is, is to treat them early. Right. Mm -hmm. Lose weight, stay active. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the crowd? No. Um, uh, thank you everybody for coming. We have another <laughs> seminar next month, which we'll be looking at. Alec. All right. So um, <laughs> anybody interested? So we have a, quite an audience here for musculoskeletal problems. So maybe you want to see some gastrointestinal problems next month as well. So <laughs> That's right. It's yours. I have you back. If you have any questions about things at the hospital here, um, want to stick around? That's so. Steve's horse. <laughs> yeah. Your, your shot, you know, you're showing the ankle that way. I talk all the time about what causes injuries and work. I think it's my ankle. Yeah. 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 Yeah